If you can imagine enrolling in a course called Board Games 101, this may be a video for you. We're going to look at 18 of the most significant board games over the last 30 years, some of the most influential designers, much of the vocabulary used by hobbyists, and understand 10 of the most engaging board game mechanics and what makes them successful. The reason an international tour of board games would begin with a game like Catan is because it was the first German-made board game to really hit the international stage with such success. Now, the game features negotiation and trade, and it also has shared income, where one player rolls the dice and the result of their die roll is shared by all players, meaning that everyone has something to do even when it's not their turn. Nevertheless, a lot of people have a love or hate relationship with Catan, much the same way they used to feel about Monopoly. So which is it? Is Catan an excellent game deserving its position in the history of board games, or is it a crummy game? I think it's a little like how you would feel if someone were to say that Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time is the greatest video game. Or Citizen Kane is the greatest movie. These things were amazing in their time, but what's more important is what they did for movies and games moving forward. Now, if you're new to the hobby and new to this channel, I want to tell you something about this rating system. This is my own personal contribution to the hobby. It's not universal by any means. However, a lot of the terms here are things that people throughout the hobby used to describe board games. Now, a lot of the games in this video are going to have a high focus on mechanics and also a low amount of interaction. That is a typical profile for what we call a Euro board game. The other extreme, more thematic games, are what we'll look at next. In 1997, the CEO of Fantasy Flight, an American importer of European comics, devised a game called Twilight Imperium. You might think of this as risk on speed, with players playing as different aliens with alien powers, exploring the galaxy, developing technologies, and conquering one another ruthlessly. It is extremely thematic, features sculpted plastic miniatures, has a high degree of conflict, and role to resolve battles. It's also what we call a meritrash. Despite sounding derogatory, that is the term that the board game community sort of adopted to compare American-made games to European-style games, and it's a misnomer in many ways. Ameritrash games aren't terrible, they're also not always American. For this reason, as well as many more, people have kind of stopped using those terms like they used to. There are several characteristic differences between Ameritrash and Euros that we could list. However, especially because there's more crossover these days, I think it's more effective to use a rating system like this one. In the year 2000, a forum website was launched called Board Game Geek and has since become the most authoritative site for all things in the board game hobby. It has a Top 100 board game list, often referred to as the BGG Top 100, where there is a highly coveted number one spot. Several of the board games in this video have had their time on the number one spot, starting with Tigris and Euphrates. Tigris and Euphrates feels a little bit more abstract. To me, it feels something like Go. It's a tile-placing game where players are fighting for area control. But I mention it because it was designed by Rainier Kinesia, a German designer who is extremely prolific, having designed more than 600 board games. So if you're going to get into this hobby, chances are you'll play something that was influenced by this man. From 2000 onward, we enter a decade of new developments Developments for board games where designers experimented with new mechanics. The game to kick off this decade was Carcassonne, a tile placing game. It was also the first game to officially adopt the term meeple for one of these. On your turn, you draw a tile, you place a tile, and to score it, you put your meeple on it. But the catch is, depending on how the tiles are placed and where the meeples are placed, an opponent can jump into one of your scoring districts and steal the points from you. Puerto Rico came out in 2002, and it stands out as a game with excellent action selection. Specifically, when a player chooses an action, they get to perform it, but 
all of their opponents also get to perform a minor action associated with what was chosen. So once again, we see a game where you get to do something even when it's not your turn. In 2004, Ticket to Ride entered the scene. Now, Ticket to Ride is about set collection and route completion. Essentially, you're using your turn to pick up cards, and when you have enough cards to complete a set, you play those cards to claim a route. But what this introduced to gameplay was the sensation of being able to take something out from somebody else who needs it. This feeling of, that's what I was going to do, ah! In fact, it's within the context of Ticket to Ride that I'll mention a new vocabulary for you, the act of deliberately taking an action or a resource that you know somebody else wants or really badly needs is what we call hate drafting. Nevertheless, it's still a very popular game with many adaptations and even a new Legacy version, and Legacy is what we call a board game that is designed to be played through in a campaign-like style only once, with several of the components being irreversibly destroyed during the course of the entire game. Twilight Struggle was designed in 2005. It's a complex game and a simulation of the Cold War. It's really a different category of games, one that predates Catan, a game called a war game. What makes this war game stand out though is how it utilizes cards with multiple purposes. Agricola came out in 2007. It is a farming game that features worker placement, a very popular mechanic in board games. It was also designed by Uwe Rosenberg, another designing giant. Dominion came out in 2008 and it popularized the deck building mechanic. Now, the idea of deck building wasn't new. Magic the Gathering had been around for a long time, but what Dominion did is enabled players to build their deck as they played the game. The gameplay was also very simple. On your turn, you draw up to five cards, you get to purchase a new card for your deck, and then you can perform an action. With this simple formula, players got to experience the thrill of the luck of the draw. Pandemic came out in 2008, and it stood out as an exciting cooperative game where players could share with one another what cards they were holding and strategically line up a plan in order to combat a disease that spread across the entire world. Seven Wonders came out in 2010, and this is what we call a drafting game, where players are holding a hand of cards, choose one, and then pass the remaining cards to the neighbor. It also introduced gameplay for up to seven players, which was an especially fun thing for me at the time because I had more people to play with. Yeah! Castles of Burgundy came out in 2011, and it was a tile-placing game, but one that used dice to perform actions. At the time, for me, it was exciting to play a game that used dice, but used it in a way that still felt strategic rather than luck-based. It was designed by a man named Steven Felt, again from Germany, who had a tremendous influence on Euro board games. To me, he was Euro board games at this time in the hobby. Resistance Avalon came out in 2012, and this was a hidden role game, something like mafia or werewolf, but the thing that made this one special is that while players were trying to guess who the bad guy was, no one is ever eliminated from the game. Codenames came out in 2015, and it's really a party game where a large group of people can get together and split into teams and play against each other. But it's a party game that has a strategic element to it that makes it really a party game for people who love Euroboard games. It was also designed by Vlada Cvatel, a Czech designer and the designer of Mage Knight, a hand management adventure style game that was really a prelude to a much more popular adventure game that we'll see soon, Gloomhaven, which came out in 2017 and is a game that ties Dungeons and Dragons into a Euro style board game. Players are literally playing the game on a book doesn't require a dungeon master, it's driven by cards rather than dice. Now in 2018, I think we entered a new trend, that of a renaissance of board game components, and it was kicked off by a game called Everdell. Everdell was worker placement with tableau building, collecting cards and laying them out in front of you 
gaining their effects cumulatively as you played through the game. But what grabbed everyone's attention were the stunning components. You had little berries and pieces of wood and amber and stone, and of course, a giant cardboard tree that stood as a centerpiece for the game. This was followed up by Wingspan in 2019, which had another centerpiece, a beautiful dice tower that looked like a birdhouse, along with excellent card art on all of the cards. This was another tableau building game. They make a game like Puerto Rico look pathetic, but it causes us to ask, where is the hobby headed to next? What's going to be the next big thing. There's so much available right now for people to engage in the board game hobby. And I invite you to join us in the joy of discovering games that are best for your table. Thank you again for watching this video. And thank you again for those of you who support me on Patreon and keep this channel independent. I hope you found this video useful and I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.